Before we get started with today's after chapter discussion, you guys get to hear a short summary of the chapter of 8.67. The summary was written by Action Kermit and it was recorded by Datto. Short summary. The chapter begins with Guardsman Takern looking out over the invading Drake army with his visually impressive and overpowered gear. Takern has seen things Zara's army wouldn't believe. Broomsticks on fire in front of the imprisoned Raskar. He watched the disintegration beams glitter in the dark near Liskor's south gate. All these moles be lost in time, like fry stolen off your plate by Mirsha. Gear and Ek touch use their projectiles to show Zerus that range is just a number as far as they're concerned. Zerus is trying to kill every knoll with an unusual class or ability with their officer hunters. Beshi struggles with commanding undisciplined tribal warriors, and Gear decides that Takira will make a dashing hat. Some adventurers from the Village of the Dead Raid show up to harass Zerus' cavalry, while Inker swoops in and saves the day by rescuing the chieftain Hawk Arrow. Egg Touch is pinned down in a grass shelter created by the shamans, having suffered brutal losses from the exchange with the Drake officer killers. For every hundred high-level Drakes they defeat, they lose two of their own. Gear tries to preserve her people by switching tactics to stealth, but is instantly discovered. So she goes for an all-out charge and shows them her vaunted hit a motherfucker with another motherfucker technique. But she learns the power of friendship and sends her high-level buddies to hit precise targets. Let her gear and editor work together to kill the Zerus general, forcing the Drake army into a rout. Plains Eye was even more successful in the field, if anything, but the Alliance of Nolish tribes is instantly divided by the discovery of a Doombringer amongst them. Plains Eye learns of the Mirsha's location, and the mathematician Yelleron confronts Marish in a tense standoff over whether Mirsha deserves to be killed like all other Doombringers. Manus and Estelia are both shitting bricks over the confrontation because it puts Seer in danger, unbeknownst to Garmarsh or Plains Eye. The moment shatters when Magnolia and Reinhardt's maids show up to rescue Mirsha, and the Earth Elemental Cotistro protects Garmarsh, ends up taking Mirsha's side, smashing the Plains Eye Doomslayers with a single swipe of his hand. He welcomes Mirsha as a Doom Bearer, and the Plains Eye can feel their sinister plans begin to unravel. This is the Stereo, and Mr. Wiggles, we are hosting today's after chapter discussion on chapter 8.67. We're going to go ahead and get started discussing. First up, the battle against the Drakes. So the Drakes have uh, come come to the Knoll's ancient field, uh, field the well, their ancient lands, and they they've started attacking, taking the fight to the Knolls. And we've got a lot of different people kind of participating in this battle, and we see it from different perspectives. I think the thing that was really interesting to me is that the Drakes are attacking kind of really without cause. The Knolls hadn't decided to do anything yet. But from a strategy standpoint, uh, it kind of makes sense. I'm, it makes actually perfect sense that the Drakes did this. And to me, yeah, I uh, thought that seeing the different perspectives of the different participants in the battle... I, that was a little bit strange for me. Uh, I don't know if I like jumping from perspective to perspective. I'm interested to see what you guys thought. Wiggles, do you want to share your thoughts to start out? Sure. Uh, just on the battle itself and all that, basically? On the whether no, or not the drakes are justified in, in taking the oh, battle yeah. okay. to the gnolls first and then also jumping from perspective to perspective. Well, for uh, I mean, morally, they're not justified, but I can understand why they're doing it, because they already know that their relations with the Nulls have like gone completely south, and it's going to lead to war. So in their mind, they're just thinking, let's launch this first. Let's launch the first attack rather than let the Nulls get the upper hand, which is understandable if, you know, horrible um <laughs> in terms of perspectives I, I don't know i've always been someone who reads multi-perspective books basically and i'm pretty used to it at this point and i do actually enjoy that kind of writing style simply because it gives you a bigger picture of what's going on rather than um, rather than just a single perspective that's pretty limited yeah, no, I don't mind the, the perspective jumping. I actually really like it in other chapters. What didn't really kind of, I guess, mostly sell it for me was the, um, I, there was like a, like we were trying to, I look from Feshi's perspective with trying to, her trying to, basically it was to display the two different fighting styles between the Drakes and the Knolls. 
And so when we were jumping back to her and she was trying to command and be a strategist and just that part felt felt a little bit uh, flat to me, but I, I'd, I'd be interested to see what other people's, what, whereas I really liked Kern's perspective. I thought his, his point of views were interesting. Anyway, I'd just be interested to see how people thought about uh, the display between the two fighting strategies from Feshi's perspective. But Rosie, you're up. Yeah, I'd have to agree with a lot of that. I think for me, it felt both definitely like a tacked on piece that this whole chapter didn't feel like in a chapter in its own self. Um, I think that'll read through much better on, you know, not a week by week basis, but as you're going through, but it, it felt like half a chapter. Um, and that also was partially because it felt, the battle felt loose. I didn't think the use of the perspectives was wrong. It just didn't feel like it had as much intention behind it in the way it tied into the narrative as the other uses of perspective we've seen throughout the war scenes. And that may just be because, you know, we've seen so many now that it's, you know, the expectations keep getting set higher and higher. And, um, but overall to me, it just gave this sense of like pirate being tired. I read this chapter and I felt bad for them because it just, they feels like they have fatigue writing all these battle scenes and they didn't know what to do with it, but some of it had to be shown. And so if anything, I would be, I would hope, I think this chapter will look better in retrospect with everything else, but on its own, it just kind of flops down because it's tired. Gotcha. Makes sense. Uh, Spanner says that they like the chapter. It made sense with how everything's been happening and playing out, made the battle scene more chaotic, which is sort of actually helped this battle. It helped how it shows, or show, helped show how fast it was happening. Rhythm and Bruise has something to say about the Drake strategy. So I thought that um, it makes a little bit of sense. They're attacking. They're attacking first. If you consider to be the entire thing to be a completely zero sum game between the Drakes and the Knolls, and if they're um, and if they were planning on trying to hit some resources and not win out right now, what I mean by that of the zero sum game is that there's when they attack first, they're likely to get more gnolls unified against them faster than they would otherwise. And longer term, I think it's likely to hurt their relations and possibly uh, war and peace with North Israel, if they care about that. And then probably not their continents, because they haven't really gotten involved, but that's my thought there, is that it, uh, it w in the microcosm, it, it made a lot more sense. If you look at it in a larger picture, I think it's a mistake for them to act like that. It's actually interesting that you mention other continents, because one thing that we do know, at least from like the assassins, is right, other continents are working to destabilize Israel. And it's and it's sort of precarious balance between humans, gnolls, and drakes. And so one thing is we still don't really know who all was behind the whole stealing the magic and changing the memories of the gnolls over all these centuries. And I wonder if there are more continents in play working to kind of rile up the drakes like what kind of i mean obviously we know that the drakes started to attack the gnolls in anticipation of going to war but i wonder if somebody tipped the balance to get them to attack uh lou dancer says i think that flipping from gnoll to gnoll was supposed to be to sort of show that the goals gnolls were a bit disorganized uh, it was a point that was hammered pretty hard Comrade Burr says it was unfortunately nothing new. There's a reference to the chapter of the fifth wall. It further reminds the reader that we're here chapters showed us how the gnolls fight differently and are generally less organized. Uh, Metamir says it seemed like it was e too easy to run around the battlefield for the gnolls, especially the smaller groups. They probably would have had to have taken a lot more losses with their actions based on how the drakes are more organized and would be able to punish poor formations. Mr. Europe has something to say about the battles. Uh, yeah, uh, I, the way I thought of the battles was uh, I, I just didn't think at any point that this battle was particularly important. And I don't mean that as criticism. I think that's like kind of the point. That the whole, uh, like that, that's why it's a bit less organized. This isn't really about the battle from how I see it from a story perspective. This is just the Drakes going in to try and kill off a couple uh, like leaders and champions of the gnolls early on uh, so that there won't be a, as big of a 
uh, blood loss later on. And the, no, like from a broader perspective or from a meta perspective, this is just Geyer and um, what's her name, the Star Noel, uh, and a few others having like gaining experience in battle for the first time. Like I never saw this as particularly important in the that this battle was anything decisive. Uh, on a side note, I would like to add that. Uh, Wallord Dragal <laughs> and his army from Fistival have been uh, planning this attack since even like since way before. They were back when Nears was doing his big march. Uh, they were already joining up to try and pull something. So it's if someone else is influencing the Drakes, I don't see I don't really see that as a possibility because this has been going on for a while. True. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. Uh, Polaric says, I don't like how the battle constituted tens of thousands of warriors were taking part on one side alone. Was it 80,000 drakes? Direct quote from the chapter. Yet the death of a single high-level drake general somehow turned the tide of battle and resolved it. And it seems anticlimactic how Jire with one skill killed this combatant. I would say the death of a general, though, is a pretty big thing, especially if they've got the skills that are helping coordinate and move everybody around. The loss of a general is going to sow confusion on the battlefield, and that part did make sense to me. And the fact that one skill can kill a combatant, also not surprising. We've we've seen one skill sort of turn the tide in, in some numerous situations, actually. So not... And it depends on the skill, right? Some of these skills are sort of higher quality, so to speak, than others. Spanner says it's guerrilla tactics on the Knolls part versus medieval squads of troops. The Drakes went high-level targets, or want high-level targets, and the Knolls are defensive after being attacked. Cleric also has to say that, like this is a battle on a scale with tens of thousands of combatants on each side, it's resolved by Jar using one skill to effectively resolve it. That might have been a little bit of written license on the part of, of Pirate. I can see that, just to kind of wrap things up and not drag this battle scene out like a, a Dragon Ball Z episode spanning one fight spanning like 20 episodes uh ren says i feel like the attack was a really stupid move from the drake's part based on how many city knolls there are and play says there's proceeding both on an academic and historic level and in world that the death of a single high level individual can win or lose a battle or even a war mr wiggles feel free to just interrupt whenever yeah. you want to speak <laughs> yeah basically just what clay just said that um a high level general is, you know, someone whose very presence boosts their entire army. And it's not it's not like that general was the only loss they had. This was an active battle. And as we saw, Jire and uh Aditor and all of them also took out uh that whole javelin squad and that uh high level major there. So there were it was cumulative losses, but the general's death basically broke the camel's back. It resulted in them saying, "Okay, this is too much. This this is too much of a loss right now. We need to retreat." And I don't even think it was a huge loss either for that army. Like they they retreated, but they didn't lose. Uh, they didn't completely lose either. That's true. Clay says it, uh, yeah, yeah. so if several people are, <laughs> we'll just, we'll give you that in a second. Do you have any other thoughts, Wiggles, that you wanted to share while people are posing their thoughts? Um, I did think, uh, I do agree with what Miss Europe was saying earlier, that this really wasn't supposed to be focused on the battle so much as it was just an opening for getting information on how the gnolls and how the drakes are approaching this. And as we get more in depth into this conflict, I think we'll see a more in depth look into this war. Like we just saw with the uh Hectival's Hectival chapters that we can get a very in depth look into war in this series, but I just don't think it was the right time in this chapter and that wasn't necessarily the point of the chapter. Yeah, it might have almost been more interesting. Uh, moving on to some oh. comments now. Yep, go ahead. Uh, we have Clay saying, it's like losing an important military site, IRL. In, in real life? Yes, in <laughs> real life. 
Thank you, Asteria. Uh, Kimmy Kimmy says, Geyer had too big of impact on the battlefield for 80,000 troops on one side. Spanner says, when Zell died at the end of, a, of Volume 4, the armor basically noped out. They lost the will to fight to support Wiggle's comment. Uh, Brack says, yeah. battle was an almost coordinated effort by multiple walled cities some of which currently fighting each other. A single central general here was a tough sell for me. Lou Dancer says, I will say that one thing that I would like to see from the fallout of this battle is Jair's reaction. This is the first time she's killed someone. She's 15. It's got to cause some trauma. And uh, ML, did you want to speak? Uh, yeah, um, you can call me Melly. Uh, so I have... Two points, one on narrative, the other one strategy and tactics. The narrative is if we talk if we looked at what Fessy was talking about, um about uh she couldn't control anything. She couldn't control her big hitters, she really couldn't control the army. So it was chaos from a strat strategy perspective. And I think the narrative really showed that by going back and forth in the POVs. And, and how chaos it was. And then at the end, it all came back together with everybody in the same location. Then Fessy, now it's like Fessy's kind of point of view in that we have now taken from the chaos into the organization. Um, that's the narrative. The strategy and the tactics, are, my take is on the drakes. If the strategy was to do a preemptive attack, knowing that they were going you have to fight this battle anyways. It's been a complete disaster for them. Uh, they've united the Norse as they think. We find out later that they it fell apart because of different reasons. But they united the Norse. They lost two of the three main battles. They have now they're now isolating the goodwill they had with City Norse potentially, and it's showing the Drake culture. If we remember, Drakes can be very very selfish. And this is really showing to the entire world, now with live TV pretty much, how the Drakes behave and act. And it really spoils any goodwill they have with any major powers or any major cities if they want to deal with a civilization that behaves like this. So I think they've lost on the PR, they've lost on the, the, the battle, they've uh, lost any goodwill. And the states that stayed out of this potentially have a political move to come in and form better relations with other uh, nodes and other cities. Um, you know, Clausewitz said, war is politics by other means. What is the political out outcome that the Drakes are trying to achieve? I, I, if it, if whatever it is, it seems they failed on it. And the tactical was that they lost two of the three uh, battles. Yes, they can reinforce their armies and go back in, but uh, it's really shown um, a lot of flaws in the thinking and the military tactics. Perhaps, That's it. <laughs> Perhaps. I don't know. I, well, their reasoning is to, just to, to get ahead on, well, there's probably multiple reasons, right? Because the is after the magical sword or whatever it was. You've got some... There's a lot of speciesism, xenophobia, from some of the Drake cities towards Knolls. You've got the ancient fights that, that, you know, apparently they were fighting for a while before, you know, they started fighting the ants and the goblins. So, you know, there's a number of reasons that they're attacking. The fact that they lost doesn't really stand them in good stead. I don't know if they're so much worried about PR, though. Uh... Clay says it thinks that the battle's role in this story can be seen mostly through Takern's and Inkar's involvement. Uh, there's a lot less of military loss and more of a risk of personal loss. Metamir says this was more like a Marvel movie battle than World War II movie battle, which is fine by them. And Comrade Burr says, on my point about these things being done before, the revelation about how a strategist needs to get a bunch of high-leveled friends to fight with each other instead of apart is literally what Nears did in the last Fellowship chapter. Yeah, and it also might even be to that point that it's not so much high-leveled friends, but the strategist needs to concentrate on certain leaders that can then control their own groups rather than trying to control everyone at once. 
And a strategist also needs to be aware of the, their fighting force, right? Uh, Feshi was trying to command like a Drake commander, I think is what was pointed out in the chapter, and not really realizing that they're dealing with a completely different tactics, essentially, right? You have to think about the tactics of the people you're commanding. Uh, Clay says that's true birth, but done in a different way from a different perspective. This one was more on the ground, where Nears was more about coordinating new fighters. And Spanner says that's how Nears got his adventuring party to name Rank. The Cephalid's dilemma was solved by Nears years ago. So let's move on a little bit to the sort of revelation that we got with what the what the sort of sea oh, what's the name of that tribe? Wiggles, what's the name of the tribe that basically seems to have been killing all the Doombringers? Plains Eye tribe. Plains Eye. So we got the revelation of what, well, maybe a very kind of big explicit confirmation with what Plains Eye has been doing and sucking away from all of the, the Doombringers that they've been killing and, and destroying over the years, right? What did you guys think of the use of that, that display of luck? Right, Takurin was the one that kind of first noted it, and then we got confirmation when basically the Plains Eye tribe just completely outright won their their side of the battle. Do you think that justifies what they were doing in kind of a horrific sense, or is just absolutely still pretty important, Mister Wiggles? Oh, I I definitely think that. Part of it is just so that kind of power wouldn't go away. But I think another part of it is literally just for Plains Eye to be so dominant. Like they took. So we don't actually know what happened in the past between Plains Eye and Doombringers, Doom Bears. Uh, but something did happen. They, they know something happened and it turned Plains Eye against them. And I think. When that happened, they decided that they were going to take all of their power and concentrate it in plain sight. And it basically gave, gives them like unparalleled power in the among the tribes because they've taken what is something that's like a big racial feature that allows them to manipulate luck and basically just blitz plain size chieftains. Um, utilize it solely utilize it solely so they and i think it also ties into why they started to say that mages aren't uh, aren't something that uh gnolls can do because as they're gaining more power they keep wanting to gain more and more power so they effectively got rid of mages in their society because they're the source of shamans so they're just constantly concentrating power into plain side and i don't think it's really a moral thing for them anymore even though you know they play it off as that as a traditional thing but it's more just constantly gaining more power for plain side to try and make them the supreme tribe we do have hints that obviously the the whole record historical record of doom bringers is actually doom bearers right we got that massive revelation and we'll get into that in a second there have been hints that there was something that those of white fur did in the past that was enough to make them have more of a negative uh, view of of what they represent and so that seems to be what Plains Eye is using to justify their actions kel makes a very interesting point though it's not just a matter of stealing the luck from you know, uh, white white furred gnolls that they've killed over the years. Uh, okay. Go ahead. There's a lie. Pack you're uh, not muted right now. We can hear some chatter. Uh, but Kel makes the point that maybe they won their side of the battle at the cost of the steel fur. So we know that the luck carries, right? There's only so much luck, good luck you can have before it has a, a negative outcome. So possible that the steel fur lost their battle because... Plains Eye won theirs. Stanner says that there's no moral justification for killing the White Knolls, uh, no matter what Plains Eye says. And then Comrade Burr, if you're up, followed by Metamir. Hey, uh, so a lot of the things I was going to say were already said, but uh, it's very important that we get the POV of Plains Eye. And whatever they're doing, they do think that it is morally correct. Like, they think that they are 
Uh, they, I think it mentions like, oh, the, the all the safeguards we've made for our people uh, are going away. So it's not like they're like you know nefariously lying. Like we see in their unguarded moments, they think what they're doing is right. So I'm curious as to what the reason is, because it can't just be you know normal bigotry. Like they they made an active decision to steal the luck from uh, the Doom Bears and you know make a basically giant PR campaign. Um, but it's important to remember that they do think that this is good for either all gnolls or just plain side. It's, it's unclear as to which one. That's all. Comrade Burbo. Okay. Not a beer? <laughs> but, uh, regarding the current's luck, he did get that new skill from his class, so it could have been some of that coming in during the battle. Um, or it could have also been being channeled through the shield that claims I gave him to help protect Iriwasha. Um, I don't think it was just a general channeling of things, but more directed like that. But yeah, I, I saw that line. Uh, Okreziak says, how much had he spent? So yeah, he definitely did use up some of that luck resource during the battle to in its own fighting. Yeah, I'm curious how they're actually gaining that, whether he is a, a Doombringer slash Victor, stealing it from, from them by killing them. Yeah, hard to know. Yeah, that was like... Go ahead, go, sorry, go ahead. Metamir, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that was actually one thing. So Kel had this theory that maybe they were stealing the luck from Steelther. I was wondering that maybe they just didn't expend any luck for Steelther. But remember that Takurin was the one that had their shield. So maybe like there's something with the shields or the objects, which is how they spread the influence of the luck, right? So like it's tied to physical objects somehow. And that's why Takurin was able to sort of benefit from it, right? They specifically gave him the shield. And so it's not just a matter of stealing it from others or, you know, directing it any which way they have, but they, they, it's tied to somehow to their, their weapons or something. Kimmy Kimmy says, Clown with Devil's Luck is, uh, has a, has a passive skill. Play wanted to bring up that the crossbow gnolls were, when, uh, were killed, they called it justice. I think there's a problem that happens throughout fantasy as a genre. Pirate, pirate usually does a really good job, but those were people with families and lives who had very good reason to believe they were doing it being the right thing. It wasn't justice. It was unfortunate, but necessary defense of an innocent child. Uh, Spanner says, Plains Eye have basically said never again. They don't want history to repeat. Doom bears leading the gnolls against Sazlar, etc. The lying and mind wiping is indefensible, though. Comrade Burr says, The shield, literally called the eye shield or something, feels like it may be a conduit for Plains Eye's luck. I would agree with that. I, there's something up with the eye that maybe seems to be funneling or tied to all of this. The eye is just super creepy and weird. So any other thoughts about the plane's eye and how they're utilizing the luck? Oh, okay. Courier says, the tribe that seems to be stealing luck can easily enchant an item for luck. I'm worried that the economy affects to Kern's class somehow. Wiggles. Yes. So on uh, Clay's mention of the crossbow knows basically being said it's justice, I don't really think it's uh i don't think it's something that the author is saying that like it's justice from their point of view i i really think that's a character thing you know a lot of you know a lot of criminal trials and all that and in our world it's a it's about making sure that justice is done without being retributive because people are so into vengeance and in a lot of ways, seeing all these people who are just about to kill you die, that's justice to a lot of people. And I don't think, I don't necessarily agree with that either, but I think it's a very, well, it's a very human reaction, but obviously they're gnolls, but you know what I mean. It's a very uh, <laughs> yeah. people reaction to think that when someone who's trying to kill you is killed in return, that that's justice. Justice, vengeance. Punitive justice versus moral justice, as Lou Dancer says. Dado thinks that the eye is probably specific in design to take 
uh, use of the luck from the dead white knolls. It's probably some magic that Elevir designed. We know she was involved in some sort of deal with them, along with the unicorn and mage of sin. So, uh, yeah, possibly. And, uh, and Eli, do you, do you just want to say it out loud? Whatever your point was? While we're waiting, I guess uh, we should. Uh, do you want to talk? Uh, do you want to bring up Doom Bears and Doom Bringers now? Yeah, I was gonna real quickly just spend a little bit of time just asking what people thought of Takern because this was like between him. Oh, yeah. yeah, between like he's kind of the one of the major characters, right? We've got this guy that kind of was this guy. Okay, so Emuli says real quickly. We'll get back to that. Emuli says the Doom Bearer Revolution questions Plains Eye greatly. At a time when there was an outstanding question on which Knoll tribe betrayed all Knolls regarding their magic being sealed. Plains Eye has benefited with Knoll's magic being sealed. They have benefited with magic being sealed and sealing Doombearer's luck. Revelations, not revolution. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, revelations. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we still don't really know what the deal with was the magic stealing was. Plains Eye was definitely involved. Why they made that choice seems to be pointing to the Doombringers slash Doombearer change. We'll have to see. But I do wonder if there is a larger thing going on. I wonder if this is going to tie to the gods or the elves somehow. It feels like the Knoll's history being changed wasn't just a matter of sealing their magic or some petty hatred. I feel like there's something way bigger there, and it's tied to the whole fact that it, you know, the Knolls are adventurers. They've been to every corner end of the earth. I my guess is that it has something to do with that. There's there's bigger stuff we're gonna see coming up in play. Uh, but yeah, anyway, to Kern. So we have this guard that we, you know, we we saw very little of before Nolmoot. Now he's kind of become one of these major characters. And in fact, you know, the point of view of this chapter was was quite a bit from him before we sort of move into our other characters. What did you guys do? You guys like him? You don't like him? Want to see more of him? The sort of everyday character without anything super special before the whole. Guardian field bear class. Wiggles, you can just talk. <laughs> I know, but it's just good to be in the habit to make sure it's reinforced. Right. Um, Co hosting. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. All right, all right, all right. I I'd like to turn to, to Kern. I'd like to Kern, but at the same time, I still feel like he's not as developed i would say as many other characters and i think this is a very good opportunity right here just showing him for what he is he's someone who wants to protect those closest to him and it, it, it's actually pretty interesting that we haven't seen these kind of shield bearer classes in detail so i'm really looking forward to seeing more of that and hopefully it'll flesh out to kern more and it'll also help flesh out in car as well because as they're close together, we could see, you know, dual dual POV to the current in car chapters, and we can get a really good look into them from what we've seen in the past. Well, Clay agrees with you. Absolutely loves to current and relationship with Incar. Do you want to take on the rest of what people's thoughts are? Sure. Action Kermit says to current isn't special now. But like Aaron showed us, heroes don't get chosen. They decide to stand up. Uh, Clay says, I was very worried this whole chapter for both him and Inkar. And yeah, I, it, it's definitely worrying whenever you get a low level, I guess you could call combatant going in with basically named adventure or high gold rank so many death uh, adventure levels. <laughs> So, yeah, so many. It, it gives him death flags a lot, <laughs> and and just having him get a shield from oh, Zerhu. Who... <laughs> is is that how you'd say it, Zerhu? I, I creepy don't shaman, know. creepy eye shaman. Done. Yeah, <laughs> creepy eye chieftain, creepy eye shaman. Like that. That was very worrying to see. Um, but it it went well so far. We'll see how it goes in the future, but it went well right now. And nobody uh, lost limbs uh, either, actually, this exactly. battle. That was the first, too. Yeah. Well, no one important. All those dead drakes lost limbs, I'm sure. Like they're but, dead, uh, unnamed. Well, the dr yeah. named drake. Anyway, yeah. 
Yeah. Comrade Burv says we actually get a bit of development with Takern as well as someone who's been around since volume one and he had to grow as a person during the Kaoru's torture arc. Melly says Geyer and Takern equals Japanese dual team comedy skit. Courier says Inkar is literally a civilian and was relevant. Uh, Kel says Zur equals sure. Yeah. It's it's a very weird word, and I have no idea how you should properly pronounce it. Maybe we should just call him Hiru. Hiru? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's no. even close. <laughs> I like it. Hiru. All right. Creepy Eyed Shaman is Hiru from now on. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> we like to Kern. Want to see more of him. He's he's growing on us. Uh, I feel bad for Andy very much. All right, so the big revelation of this chapter was Doom Bears, right? We had the Earth Elemental kind of have this big revelation. Apparently it's dead, it's not even alive. And had the revelation that Doom Bringers are not Doom Bringers, they are Doom Bearers. So, how, and then we've got the splitting of the gnolls, right? So, how do you guys think that this is going to, he's only mostly dead. How do you guys think this is going to play out? Is this, is this going to, the fact that they're doom bearers, what do you think that means? I'll start out just to give uh, people some time, but I think this is a, it was, a, it was definitely the correct way to do it. Like I, I heard that they were thinking about doing a few other names as well during the stream. And so I think having it so close to Doombringer makes the most sense it just from like, a historical revisionist kind of standpoint. If you want to change something from Doom Bear, choose something that's very close to it, but means something very different. And to me, Doom Bear means that these people, like they bear the doom of their tribe, but they didn't cause it. They're basically marked by how their tribe has fallen and died, but they're given strength because of that. And they, and I think some of the uh, the parables we saw from last chapter with or two chapters ago with Satar, uh, I think some of those parables um, are basically saying doom bears are people you should listen to when they say something is going to go wrong. Like they're basically Roman guardians for uh, the gnolls, at least they were in the past. They go around ensuring everyone is. Uh, is aware of how fate is turning and aware that luck is not on their side at times. Like with the story of the Beast of Noct, I think it was, that Doom Bear was trying to give them warnings about what was coming, but they wouldn't listen. And so the parable should be listen to Doom Bringers or listen to Doom Bears, but now it's been changed into Doom Bringers are the cause of this doom. And so I, I think that it was a very good uh, reveal. Like it's so close in meaning and, and so close in just the structure of the word that it works very well to, as it is now. Yeah, that that's true. So it's interesting to hear that there were different other options. This, it works perfectly. Uh, just this small switch, the fact that it's so close. I'm glad this is the option that was decided upon. Action Kermit suspects that doom bearers are meant to warn the tribes and deliver doom to the enemies of gnoll kind that can't be defeated by anyone else. They bear the magic of all the fallen gnolls of their tribe, hence the reason why white gnolls are more magical compared to regular gnolls is the thoughts of Dado. Uh, a couple people are having fun with the fact that placeholder was apparently used <laughs> during the chapter streaming. You guys have a lot of fun with saving those screenshots, don't you? How many of you guys do you have you saved up of those? Uh, Kel says, my theory is that Doombringer, Doombearers are supposed to be some kind of guiding class for the gnolls, sort of a, a prophetic prophecy, prophecy uh, in that they see catastrophic catastrophe coming, like a super advanced danger sense, and not guide gnolls away from it. Spanner says, Doombringer brings the doom. Doombearers know what doom is about. They get it. Huge difference. Metamir asks, what does Doom even mean in this story? We have the Doom Speaker crease as well. So, like, what is Doom? Death and destruction. So this is actually, 
I wonder if, because remember, one of the earliest things at the end of Volume 7 that we that was talked about was all the different roles and promises that different species had made to keep the gods at bay, right? And a lot of species have forgotten, and the elves are like, Ryoko, you need to go remind people and gather everyone together. And so, just always looking ahead, I wonder if the Doombearer class actually has to do with something that the gnolls promised, right? When dealing with the gods. Like, it's not just just for the gnolls, but it, it ties, once again, something into religion, something into what the gnolls did in that pact to basically get religion out of in-world. Any, anyway, just that, that's my, my thought, is I think the Doom Paraglass is, is tied up in the gnolls' ancient pact, and something has messed with that to make them forget. And Clay but it says, I believe that it's a very strange mechanic for gnolls to have that other races don't. What do you think, Wiggles? Do you think I'm crazy or? Um, I don't think it's a crazy assertion, but I just don't think it's something we can know so well right now. Just basically anything to do with the gods is huge mystery at this point and it's so hard to make predictions based on anything like that right now just because of how um how little we know of the time of that time and how little we know of what went on so i don't think it's a bad i don't think it's a bad prediction i just don't think it's one we can know so well right now um Cole, uh, Clay also says it would also tie Mercia into fight into the fight against the gods, which seems to be coming up. Um, Holdbringer has a semi thought out theory stating what I'm thinking is that Nolkine during the Age of Fire learned how to manipulate fate as a force in the universe, found paths to manipulate fate as just another force like mana or aura. Conversations with the Fae have also alluded to this. And that these manipulations of fate are what allowed Nolkine to survive the era of dragons, but also gave rise to the Raskar. Because there are consequences to interfering, interfering with fate, as the Stone, Spear tri Stone Spears tribe learned. The Plains Eye tribe is an ancient tribe of shamans who learned how to bring their shamanic magics to the next level by harvesting doom bears, those who are marked by fate for lives of destiny. And they learned how to do this from researching the Raskar, who also benefit from harvesting and consuming doom bears. That's an interesting theory. I, it would explain why gnolls would be so would be one of the only races that have this kind of uh, white fur doom bear dichotomy. Metamir says, it could be an automatic prote protection that kicks in when enough damage is done to gnolls, like an animal being backed into a corner. Um, Spanner says, in, re in relation to Coldbringer's theory, if that was the case, surely, like fire, memory would have existed sooner. And, you know, with all, with all green skills... You have to realize that a lot of that is probably just a narrative license. Like <laughs> every every skill that has ever existed probably should have has existed at this point simply because um, there's like fifty thousand, a hundred thousand years of history at least of every species. So that's a lot of time for every skill ever to be created. But I feel like narrative license should be given its due and allowed to take place. I don't know. I think you have to be, um, be, care be, be careful with that. I'm going to actually just respond to that thought, Wiggles, before you read out Comrade Burb's thoughts. When you're using narrative license, you have to be careful. And I think when you're going to come up with new skills, there has to be some justification as to why they had never been used before. Obviously, we can think of a half a different situations where they may not have been the case, but that probably is something to be careful with when we probably start seeing new skills pop up, uh, you know, reasoning out why this would not have necessarily been seen before. Because new skills are a big deal. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And 
you could see that issue a lot. Well, but you can see that being an issue for a lot of people in terms of earlier green scales, such as Final Run. Like Final Run, that honestly shouldn't be a green scale simply because of the wording. And you, there, there should have been hundreds, thousands of people who could come up with the skill like Final Run over time. But just tweaking that wording a little bit is really uh, the way to go to make it so the narrative license isn't as big of a deal. Um, Comrade Burb says, looking at everything we know about Doombringers and Bears, I think it is clear that white gnolls are given the luck and fortune of their tribe in the same way shamanic magic works. I think they appear unconsciously where doom is imminent and the earth elemental shows that Mercia isn't the one causing the doom. Like Mercia didn't cause the Raskagar to come out from the dungeon. They've clearly been there before Mercia was even born. We see that doom strikes in twice a week. And while Mercia is usually in the inn when these things happen, it could be that Mercia was fated to live in end because of all the doom that was ine uh, inevitable to strike it. Um, Oshi posted a picture of a theory, and it states, everyone remarked that the stand around Zuru, Zurhi, Hiru, 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 was to feel his aura. They mistook his true advantages for an aura, which was well, but Takern truly felt it as uh, Hiru called upon the power that made Plains Eye greatest of all. Ofa, uh, Hiru is a <laughs> Doombringer. Uh, Oshi says he endorses this theory. Doombringer versus, uh, versus Doombringer. If not a Doombringer himself, he is descended of one. Uh, just a quick aside on this, Oshi. I, I feel like instead of him being a doom bear, I think his tribe like harnesses doom uh, doom bears and harnesses their luck. But that's just a quick aside. I'm gonna keep going with the rest of these comments. Courier says the fake the faith block could be allowing skills to be original again. Maybe that would be an interesting uh, theory to explore. Uh, Oshi says, the kingdoms of the plains I fell. Um, Spanner reacts to the Doombringer theory that uh, the ultimate, by saying the ultimate Doombearer, he steals the luck of other Dooms. Oshi says, we've been told disasters produce Doombearers. Comrade Burv says, I think Kalruz's death before Dishonor skill is a bit weird to be green. I get it's the motto he came up with, so maybe it could, it would be unique, but again, tens of thousands of years, surely someone else had such a simple catchphrase. Uh, in response to that, Coldbringer says, it's in, it is impossible for Wondrous Fair to be a truly unique skill because the Fae have been feeded on Enroll before. Uh, I, I think that meant feasted. Green probably just means unique at the current time among living mortals. Oshi responds to Comrade Burv's theory as well by saying, it's not about the catchphrase, it is always about perspective. Uh, when it comes to skills, Karuz wants to survive and balance the skills, so he dies with his honor intact. The green aspect reflects that the system itself found that a powerful enough effect to create a skill from it. L says, feats celebrated. Uh, don't read that. I'm going to read it. <laughs> Anyways, because That's... I want to know that I'm being stupid. Thank you, Kel, for telling me I'm being stupid. New definition. Why does that deserve a penguin? Anyway, all right. So uh, discussion will continue. I'm just going to wrap it up here. Speaking of unique pronunciations, <laughs> we had one. Oh, Asteria. What? One second, one second. Oh, uh, no. um, Edge Dancer brought up a good point that we might want to discuss uh, the, th the survey at the very end just to get everyone's thoughts on the, what they thought about the survey. We don't need to record, to do record that? that, though. We can we, Discussion okay. is going to continue. I'm not, I'm not killing discussion. I'm just killing the recording section. Okay. Uh, oh, it's actually in there? Okay. Well, my, so I'll start it off. My fate, I always love unique names. It's one of my favorite, favorite points <laughs> of the chapter. So cheers to Trey's. I thought it was great that we got the Earth Elemental's name. Uh, so Trey's immediately put me in mind of Trey's Kushernada from Gundam. So I'm wondering if, if Pirate is a secret Gundam fan. 
Uh, anyway, happy points about the chapter. Let's end on that. Uh, if you want to say something you really liked or something you really enjoyed, speak now or forever be silent. Wiggles, any thoughts? Gil Road. It was a good chapter. Pirate Abbott did well. And that's the compliment of the day. It's hard to comment on action. Okay. Spanner really liked that uh, Mishra accepted her fate. Cal enjoyed my eyes. Uh, the my eyes line. Ren says that Yilron is a JoJo character. And that Comrade Burr says the pirate wrote that Yilron facing his death uh, is inevitable. It was actually really well written. So I think we really actually do like the mathematics character, surprisingly. Somehow Yaron predicting Mishra made me feel emotional. JEVs says, not really emotional, but it was cute. Sunglasses will always be my forever favorite. That's me, not Yaron. Uh, and then Amir thought it was great that it was be being able to finish the chapter before falling asleep. So the shortness was actually appreciated as well. Any final thoughts from anyone? Mathematic characters are cool. Don't be insulted mathematics <laughs> hysteria. Come on. I said, on, I said cool. it was good. I like it. Okay. Was cool. no, no, it's not. But I <laughs> enjoy the character. Um, all right. That's going to wrap us up here. We'll continue discussion later. And we'll continue discussion. You guys should have been here for it if you wanted to hear it and you're listening to the recording. Wrapping up our recording today is a piece by Rhythm and Bruise, our bard. He went ahead and released an updated version of Resurrection Party. have been waiting, searching for anything there. Lightning flash! Immortal beings fear from beyond where we know. Thunder roar! Secrets of dead kings and druids and tribes everywhere. Guard and wait! It all draws together, the world holds its breath and stops time. Sleep no more! Up from darkness is an innkeeper hero. This insensitive reset to zero is the crazy humans alive. Open up the taps and let the blue fruit juice flow. Gather the guests and let in all who should know the consequences. Set up the chest, but leave a quiet table. Seek for her help for the eternal.